Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar program, Defining Metabolic Signatures, Aging, Diabetes, and Depression. And at this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Betsy Redmond. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to do a review of some of the highlights of metabolomic signatures in aging, diabetes, and depression. But DSL is starting a DSL Academy, and it'll have the long version of each of these, and then it has some other omics training and some GI map stuff. Okay, so metabolomics is the analysis of all metabolites in the system, referred to as the metabolome. It's generally, it's a collection of metabolites. It provides analysis of energy and energy byproducts, and it could be modified with diet and lifestyle generally. So metabolomics is um, already being used to help define what was previously not well or not easy to define. So the NIH research has included it in looking at stage of kidney disease, in looking at things like um, pregnancy complications, in looking at tumor and how to, how to look at those better. So it's, it's pretty varied. The metabolome is relatively recent um, entry into the omic spectrum and is represented by metabolites that transcend the genome and the pro proteome. So they represent the most downstream stage of metabolism. So you have RNA, DNA in the genome, the proteins in the pro proteome, and then metabolites like lactic acid, citric acid, things that are endogenously produced. So metabolomics identifies how well a person functions. So a phenotype really makes what kind of person got made. And then um, so metabolomics is going to see how you function. And metabolomic signatures are really looking at that. So research is finding that most diseases result in a specific metabolic pattern or signature that's reflective of cell specific cellular activities. So it's important to know, you know, what area you're looking at, what pathways, and know all those. So, you know, in, in integrative and functional medicine, we'll look at metabolite A, metabolite B. Um, so we know that pathway. If the enzyme's not working, then we have metabolite C. And so we need to know all the areas of a pathway to really get an idea of the metabolomic signature. So this is kind of the uh, diagram that you'll normally see in metabolomics research. Um, you see some other ones, but I, I think these are the most clear. Um, so they're looking at specific disease, and then they're looking at what pathways are most impacted. So they'll look at whole things like amino acid metabolism, um, serine glycine threonine metabolism. So this one, tryptophan metabolism stands out as significant. So if you're going to look at tryptophan metabolism and metabolites, you then go in and look at all the specific pathways within tryptophan and those individual pathways. So this is just looking at the kinurinin pathway it's not looking at serotonin or, or the indoles, and looks at each of their enzymes, and then you'd look at nutrient cofactors, so kind of digging deeper. So generally, metabolites include in metabolomics organic acids, amino acids, steroids, breakdown products, fatty acids. So at DSL, we have the, um, the omics profile, and it's set up to look at markers, it looks at the same things all organic acids are going to look at, but it also is going to look at them in a way that's conducive with looking at metabolomics research. So there's metabolic processing, glycolysis and fatty acids going into Krebs cycle, the pathways of the amino acids, looking at nutrient cofactors and diet, stress and mood markers, toxins, and then the impact of microbial metabolites. So we're going to look at aging first. So aging biology is intimately associated with dysregulated metabolism, and that's one of the hallmarks of aging. And this diagram here is from a study, and they looked at the top 100 metabolites most strongly influenced by age, and then looked at the effects over 10 years. So um, it just kind of gives you an idea of how they're looking at these of changes. So this is a diagram of 
chronological age, what's on your driver's license, and biological age. So they do have a correlation, and this R squared is the correlation, so it's 0.67, so I'm going to say 0.68. So 68% of the variation in biological age is going to be accounted for by chronological age. So chronological age is important predictor of mortality and morbidity, but it's unable to account for the real heterogeneity that you see in a decline in physiologic function and health with advancing age. So this I find really interesting. So if you find there's these two men and one of they're both about 20 something and one has a biological age below 15 and the other one's like 40. And then here are two women. They're both around 60. One has a biological age below 35 and the other one looks like she's close to 95. So what's accounting for those differences? So this is a 2022 review article, and it notes the most consistently observed changes in met metabolomics research of aging. So it's really getting started. Um, and it's looking at those things that are gonna change in the pathway. So amino acids. Tryptophan generally is found to decrease with age and tyrosine goes up. These changes in lipids are probably familiar. Most people's lipids kind of go up. Um, changes in hormones, oxidative stress goes up, need for glutathione, diet changes, inflammation, which is included increases in ornithine and kinuronic acid, and then your recycle function and excretion. So there's some consistencies. So let's start with tryptophan. And there's a known change in plasma metabolites of the kinuronin pathway with age. So we know that happens. So if you look at this table, they looked at almost a thousand individuals and they looked to see what was most associated with age. Well, the first one they have is CRP. So that's um, something probably everybody's used to, you see CRP. And the other one a little bit higher is kinurinin. So kinurinin is, a, is more associated with age than CRP. And then as noted, the tryptophan the TRP um, is lower. So this is all metabolites, their abbreviations, and then over on the diagram on the right, they have the names. Um, so the kinurinin to tryptophan ratio is actually a marker that's more significantly related with aging than CRP. So why might that be? So over here on this uh, diagram, you can see that tryptophan, this is the kinurinin pathway. It goes down to these kinurinin markers, also called tricats. Um, and normally TDO is going to take that, but if there's any type of inflammation, or generally TNF-alpha, um, like you might see as someone, you know, with aging, then IDO builds up. IDO pulls more tryptophan down the kinurinin pathway, and you have less tryptophan. So you're gonna see an increase in that tryptophan, um, kinurinin to tryptophan ratio. The other one that you see is probably the highest is that quinolinic acid. So this pathway goes all the way down to quinolinic acid, which then makes NAD. So quinolinic acid is the precursor of NAD, but NAD is known to decrease with aging. So it may be that inflammation also impairs this QPRT pathway. I also want to note that as I go through these slides, if your mind wanders, um, I have put up here what I'm covering. So aging, mood, diabetes. So you, you know what I'm covering um, for each one. So why is it that, that this might happen? So inflammation, infl inflammation sorry, aims to restore tissue homeostasis after injury or infection. Age-related decline of tissue homeostasis can cause a physiologic low-grade chronic inflammatory phenotype known as inflammagy that is involved in many age-related diseases. So activation of tryptophan metabolism along the kinurinin pathway can help prevent hyperinflammation and induces long-term immune tolerance. So you'll see that, you know, as there's increased inflammation, you see an increase in kinurinin and its 
can urinate in metabolites, and, they're, and some are neurotoxic, which is probably referring to quinolinic acid, and then tryptophan goes down. So that also re results in less NAD or niacin production and lower indoles, which are bacterial action on tryptophan. So it can re a ha result in age-related decreases um, and reduced lifespan. So when we're looking at a report that has this in it, you can see that tryptophan is very low and conurinin is high. So the conurinin to tryptophan or the KT ratio is elevated. I mean, that's pretty elevated. What also makes this probably worse is that this tryptophan is, you know, going down to conurinin. So it's getting pulled down there so much so that there's not even enough um, of the tryptophan to make serotonin because the 5 hydroxy acetic acid marker is a marker of serotonin turnover. So we're not, it's not even able to get enough tryptophan to make um, serotonin. So you'd want to first start with um, decreasing inflammation. The other area I'm going to look at is the quinolinic acid. Is it elevated? And what's the ratio with kinurinic acid? Because kinurinic acid can kind of help blunt those effects. So inflammation so is also associated with pro-inflammatory biomarkers that increase with age. So C-reactive protein, we just noted, is elevated with age, but so is interferon gamma, which can um, increase IDO activity, interleukin-6, and tumor necrosis factor. So inflammation is a problem with aging, as noted, but it's also important to know, is everything going up? Are all the markers elevated, and how, how high is that inflammation? The other research that's been noted with um, aging is branch chain amino acids. So these are two 2022 articles, both finding that blood levels of branch chain amino acids decrease in healthy individuals, generally thought to be due to, you know, sarcopenia or loss of muscle mass. So you can see the, um, the one on the left, the green is thing, are things that are decreased with age. So this is the age category, it says age. So valine, leucine, isoleucine, and tryptophan decrease with age. This diagram on the right breaks people up into age groups. And so as they reach the 60 to 70 year old age group, there's a big drop in those branch chain amino acid markers, the isoleucine, valine, um, and leucine. So the branch chain amino acids um, are the most abundant amino acids in proteins. They're involved in maintenance of skeletal muscles. They help regulate protein synthesis and degradation, as well as immune responses, telomere length, and oxidative stress. So you can see that it goes down with age, and that can be significant. It can lead to other downstream impacts. So if you're looking at someone's total uh, branch chain amino acids. Here you can see the, the valine is low, the isoleucine is low, and the leucine is low. So those are issues. So you'd want to check, is this person, are, are they losing muscle mass? Are they getting enough protein? So looking at the other amino acids would be helpful with that. This is an article that's pretty interesting. They looked at what markers are currently associated with age and then looked to see what markers were associated with aging over time. So they sought, sought to develop a metabolic signature of biological aging that could predict changes in physiologic function with the convenience of a blood sample in older adult, adults and then track them over a five to 10 year time frame. And when they first looked at the associations of metabolic, of biological age at baseline, they specifically found that higher homo, homocitrulline was associated with um, seen in those who were biologically older. So um, 
you can see there's some other markers, the six, this five, six, seven, eight, that's actually BH4 or c -optrin. These are um, cannabinoid and certain ketone receptors, and these are endogen non-endogenous compounds. So homocytoline is the one that um, you're able to, to get as a test, um, and it's offered on, on the omics. So why, why is that? So homocytoline comes from the urea cycle and that can be impaired in aging. The main function of the urea cycle is to turn ammonia, toxic ammonia, into urea and make arginine. So ammonia exists as ammonium, so NH4, you can see at the top of the, um, the diagram here, and that's produced by metabolism of amino acids or compounds with nitrogen. And it comes to the urea cycle and becomes carbonyl phosphate. And um, looking for my little pointer. Um, carbonyl phosphate, that binds with ornithine, becomes citrulline, that leaves the mitochondria. It goes around and then it makes arginine, gives off urea. Then ornithine goes back into the mitochondria. Outside the mitochondria, Ornithine makes polyamines, which have also been associated with aging when they're low. And then ornithine can also be involved in proline. So the formation of homocitrulline is known as a process called carboylation or carbomylation. So carbomylation leads to the accumulation of homocitrulline during aging, various diseases, and smoking. So increased homocitrulline is also associated with, and they just tend to happen at the same time. They're not necessarily happening because of it. Um, advanced glycation end products, which most people have probably heard of. So carbomylation and glycation from AGEs compete for the modification of proteins. So pro-aging effects of endogenous of AGEs have certainly been noted. So here you see this homocitrulline is, is elevated. It's pretty elevated. So if this were my test, I'd be concerned with that. There's also orotic acid that is elevated because the carbonyl phosphate combined with lysine go to make homocitrulline or it can go over and make orotic acid. So both of them being elevated makes me think there could be an impairment in that urea cycle. The majority of people who do the test have less than DL with homocitrulline. So this is a nice 216 report, and they show that protein carbomylation is a hallmark of AG. The results show that the reaction's not restricted to disease conditions, but that carbomylation occurs physiologically during aging, including tissue um, and plasma accumulation of homocitrulline at the highest ages of life. So several articles have found homocitrulline to be associated with aging, and aging is known to be a progressive um, process, which includes increases in protein and lipid modification and glycation resulting in AGEs. And glyca glycation's been considered over time, so people are familiar with that. But carbomylation seems to also play an important role in tissue and aging, and homocitrulline is probably the best way to look at that. So glutathione is another marker, and, and, and it's an intracellular antioxidant that's known to decrease with aging. So glutathione is made up of um, cysteine, glutamic acid, and glycine. So uh, cysteine can be rate limiting for glutathione production. Cysteine. So cysteine is the um, is the oxidized form of cysteine. So it has to come into the cell, and it can be rate limiting for glutathione production. And increased levels have been associated with aging, oxidative stress, and cellular dysfunction. So you want to keep it in kind of a balance. You don't want it too high. You don't want it too low. Alpha hydroxybutyric acid. It gets shot off of cystothionine when it goes to make glutathione, so it's used as a marker to identify if there's increased rate of glutathione synthesis, so is more glutathione being made. Elevated pyroglutamic acid has been shown to increase with age and is thought to be related to cysteine insufficiency 
or glycine availability, and both are needed for glutathione production. So here we see someone that has low cysteine, looks like they're making a lot of glutathione with that elevated alpha-hydroxybutyric acid, and then elevated pyroglutamic acid. So clinicians may add either glutathione or NAC or glycine. This is um, the table that I've made that looks at um, the patterns for, with aging that are seen. So if you if you go to the DSL Academy and this is up, it'll have it'll go through all of these because we didn't look at these. We looked at some of all of them. We looked at some of the highlights. You know, so there's some stuff that happens with the Krebs cycle. There are some markers that are changed in older adults who are are just you know, frail. So what are the considerations? Um, and I did my considerations, I thought it was kind of clever, as uh, diet, activity, and supplements, because it's the opposite of SAD. Um, so um, diet, generally with aging, adequate car carbohydrate with protein can help ensure adequate tryptophan levels, because there's some competition there. I'll cover that a little bit later. Um, and ensure adequate total protein that's evenly distributed throughout the day. Because besides physical activity, total protein intake is probably the most important determinant of skeletal mass in aging. So, and then trying to get that. And then be careful of things like collagen tends to lack some try tryptophan. There are some studies that have tryptophan-enriched collagen. So excess protein intake may impact homocitrulline. So you want to look at those. And then avoiding things that can result in AGEs may just make sense if you have elevated homocitrulline, although everybody should probably avoid, you know, certain frying foods and things to make AGEs. Um, and anti-inflammatory diet or supplements may help decrease inflammation overall or the, and the KT ratio. Exercise can actually activate kinurinin clearance, so it can suppress the accumulation of kinurinin in that pathway. Weight-bearing exercise can increase muscle mass and help maintain branched-chain amino acids. Adequate sleep can help ensure better immune function and, you know, support dietary insufficiencies, nutrients, fibers, targeted treatments like anti-inflammatories, fish oil, NAD, um, and then consider is there a need for glycine or NAC glutathione support. The other area I'm going to cover is diabetes. So, um, and I'm looking at like dysmetabolism to type two diabetes. So, you know, right now you can easily do an A1C or oral glucose tolerance test. And those are the most common screenings and they have their advantages and disadvantages. Um, and, you know, they can, you, you can use these classic biomarkers to identify prediabetes. Um, but it may not be quite useful enough. And metabolomics can be considered for, you know, used to help differentiate the metabolic function. So start looking at what's happening at the, the metabolic level or molecular level. So prior to the onset of uh, prediabetes, the um, level of ketones branch chain amino acids and aromatic amino acids and the glutamate and glutamate ratio are known to increase. So in this, so here beta hydroxy uh, butyrate or butyric acid is a ketone and that increases. The glutamine, this is glutamate to glutamine ratio increases. Um, uh, overall amino acids and branch chain amino acids increase. So Branch chain amino acids and the aromatic amino acids, and you can see down here, the aromatic amino acids are phenylalanine and tyrosine, and they can be useful biomarkers for monitoring the early response to therapeutic intervention. Elevated branch chain amino acids and reduced glycine have been noted as some of the most robust and consistent amino acid markers for prediabetes, insulin resistance, and the future of diabetes. So looking at um, this report, this is two separate things. So this on the left-hand side, I just have to put left, um, this is a, the combination of two studies. 
So it's a 216 study and a 2020 study. They were both meta analysis and um, reviews, and they looked at the metabolites associated with the risk of type 2 diabetes. So they both found the same things that increased branch chain amino acids or isoleucine, leucine, and valine, tyrosine, and phenylalanine, and alanine and were associated with higher risk of type 2 diabetes and lower um, levels of glycine and glutamic acid. So in those with impaired fasting glucose and type 2 diabetes, the fasting level of branch chain amino acids, aromatic amino acids, and alanine increased as glycemic control was lost. So you can see this as an example of somebody, and this is, you know, somebody who actually had very uncontrolled diabetes. And the response might be, well, they already knew they had uncontrolled diabetes. So what does this help? So this lets you see at a molecular level how, how impacted it is. So these are pretty striking numbers as far as plasma branch chain amino acids, um, these all being elevated and then the glycine and glutamine being low. So changes may be easier to see in these molecular levels. So um, you, it, can, it can help with there. They're also more likely to have um, elevated inflammatory markers. The concentrations of these amino acids, besides correlating with fasting glucose and A1C, they also correlated with pro-inflammatory cytokines like TNF-alpha and IL-6. So then the question may be, why? Why branch chain amino acids um, are so elevated with diabetes and um, glucose issues? So branch chain amino acid catabolism or their breakdown has shown to be downregulated in type 2 diabetes. So they're just not broken down as much. But the increase in branch chain amino acids increases, stimulates mTOR or the mammalian target of rampomycin, which interestingly is also increased in some aging research. Um, so that plays a role in the pathogenesis of beta cell function. So mTOR, you're gonna get decreased insulin receptors, increased insulin resistance, and just overall decreased beta cell function. In the research studies, they found that in obese subjects, increased branch chain amino acids precede alterations in glycemia and predicts the development of type two diabetes. And that's more significant in, in people who also have um, obesity. So some other reasons why, that, why they may, may be happening is that insulin resistance adults showed an increased potential to synthesize branch chain amino acids, which is known to be driven by fecal bacterial species, such as Previt pellicobri and Bacteroidetes vulgatus. And they have a decreased potential for branch chain amino acid uptake, like they're not going to get it, we're not going to metabolize that, and we're not going to break it down. So that can lead to increased circulating levels of branch chain amino acids, leading to higher risk of impaired metabolic function. Researchers have also identified that higher levels of good fecal bacteria, such as Fecalibacterium prodsnitzi or F. prodsnitzi, was associated with lower circulating levels of branch chain amino acids and lower insulin resistance. So here is this you know, same ex example, a test report of someone with uncontrolled diabetes that has also very low or less than detection limit of Fecalibacterium prodsnitzi, which is a major um, producer of short chain fatty acids. The interesting part of this, like even more interesting, <laughs> is that Prevotella copri has been found more abundant in people on a vegan or vegetarian diet. So they may be getting more protein, but they're also getting probably more polyphenols and more fiber. And that the branch chain amino acid degradation pathway was actually enriched. So they may have other pathways in, in, in vegan and vegetarian diets. So they actually had lowering of circulating branch chain amino acids. So it may have, you know, 
a lot to do with the gut bacteria and supporting that, not just not, you know, having more of those that are going to not address it. I think there's something similar with um, TMAO. So increased glutamine to glutamate ratio. So a high plasma glutamine to glutamic acid or glutamate ratio was associated with lower risk of diabetes in the Framingham Heart Study. So higher was better. Um, so looking at this example, lowers not what you want. It was, so, was also found in the large PrimeMed study and in another large study here. So you may see it listed as glutamic acid to glutamine, different ways. But what it comes down to is that you want more glutamine and less glutamic acid. So however they put it. Um, glutamine supplementation in some studies has been noted to improve some glucose control and it didn't have an impact on um, lipids such as LDL. So that's something you may want to look at. The other one that's um, a good marker that can be years earlier, a high plasma alpha amino adipic acid was associated with a fourfold risk of future type 2 diabetes up to 12 years before the onset of avert disease um, in the Framingham Heart Study. And the level of alpha amino adipic acid did not correlate with other metabolite markers of diabetes, like branch chain amino acids or aromatic amino acids, suggesting there is a distinct physiologic pathway. So alpha amino adipic acid has been identified as a novel predictor of diabetes development in humans, identifying at-risk individuals before any detectable glucose abnormalities. So if you'll notice this reference is uh, with uh, clinicaltrials.gov. So they're actually in the middle of doing a clinical trial. I think they might just have finished in March. The other thing that's, that's you know, good to look at is fructose intake. So data from meta-analysis of 46 comparison studies showed that both isocaloric or hypercaloric, so whether your calories stayed the same or you ate too many calories, fructose intake could induce um, hepatic insulin resistance in normal weight non-diabetic adults. And high fructose diets have consistently caused insulin resistance in animal models. And they're looking at really diets with a lot of added sugar. They weren't looking necessarily at, you know, berries and things. And besides gut bacteria being involved with the breakdown and, or, of branch chain amino acids, gut bacteria is also involved in diabetes in general, associated with diabetes itself and not just branch chain amino acid. So lactobacillus has been positively correlated with fasting glucose um, and glycosylated hemoglobin. The levels of acromanzia mucinophilia was negatively correlated with A1C. The levels of lactobacillus were higher in patients with type 2 diabetes, and bifido was significantly more frequent in healthy people. Um, Escherichia coli or E. coli was more abundant in another study, and butyrate producing gut microbiota, rosburia, and F. Prodsnitsi were lower. So really, for overall health, you know, it is associated with diabetes, but overall health, you want to have um, higher levels of the bifido, um, F. Prodsnitsi, acromanzia, roseburia. So those ones that really um, are robust. So these are markers associated with diabetes. Again, um, they are, you know, I didn't cover all of those. And um, so the module will have more itself. So there is some looking at some metabolic processing that's pretty good research there, some of the nutrition. But generally, you're going to find higher levels of these branch chain and aromatic amino acids, a need for um, glutathione. Glu um, and equal, surprisingly, is considered um, protective for that. So what are the considerations for that? So balance um, diet, so animal-based diet and plant-based diet, so balancing those proteins to kind of help not having those branch-chain amino acids 
overwhelm. Um, avoid nutrient excess, so limit added sugar. So some of these are obvious, but if you're doing metabolite, if you're looking at the metabolites, you can see what they're doing. Increase fibers and polyphenol to build good gut bacteria. An anti-inflammatory diet or supplements may help to lower elevated levels of citric acid, sisaconitase, or succinic acid. So we didn't review those, that's in the big module, but those tend to go up when there's um, in diabetes or impaired glucose tolerance um, because the enzymes moving those on are very susceptible to inflammation. So exercise promotes branch chain amino acid catabolism so it can help there, adequate sleep, and then target dietary insufficiencies, B, B vitamins or commons, and then the, the fiber and polyphenols. So then going on to depression. So um, these are some markers that look at some of the different biological markers that have been reviewed with depression. So inflammation, IL-6, CRP, TNF-alpha, neurotransmitter, emitters, um, endocrine function, metabolic growth factors, and the kinurinin pathway. Kinurinin, this is 3-hydroxykinurinin, which is the same thing as hydroxykinurinin. It's just how you decide to write it. And then quinolinic acid. So metabolomics and major depressive disorder. In a review of three data sets, a total of 23 metabolites were found to be significantly different between people with major depressive disorder and control groups. After qualifying for statistical issues, subgroup analysis was done based on antidepressant exposure and revealed the differences between people who had major depression and were antidepressant free and people who had depression and were on antidepressants. So when you're looking at mood disorders, it, it's, you can look broadly, but a lot of the research looks specific, like people who are depressed, people who have anxiety, and certainly there is overlap. Also looking at people who are getting treatment, are they antidepressant free or are they on treatment? So this, the nice study, they, they displayed it, I thought in a really nice way, you know, that it was easy to understand at people who didn't have or antidepressant free or all of them. And what they found in untreated individuals, proline tended to be higher, ketones were higher, tryptophan, kinurinic acid, kinurinin, creatine, creatinine, those were all lower. So even uh, glutamine was a little bit lower in looking at everyone. So data from NHANES data, so like almost 30,000 people's population study, determined that tryptophan intake was inversely associated with self-reported levels of depression. A diet rich in tryptophan had a positive impact on mood and cognition. Increasing dietary tryptophan relative to other amino acids increased the proportion of tryptophan. And sometimes that can be hard because if you have an increased intake of large neutral amino acid, it can compete for tryptophan for the blood brain barrier transport and decrease tryptophan. So large neutral amino acids include tryptophan along with phenylalanine, and tyrosine, valine, leucine, isoleucine. So it's like they're all going, but tryptophan's just kind of a little bit weaker. I guess it doesn't elbow its way in there. So if you have foods that are high in all these, tryptophan's probably a little bit lower. And then these other ones, I always think of poor little tryptophan, just can't get across. So um, you want to look at, you know, all that. So exercise is associated to increase plasma tryptophan because it decreases those branch chain amino acids. So it gives them a little leg up. Um, research has, has noted that eating carbohydrates along with protein can help get another leg up for tryptophan, along with antioxidants, rich foods, probiotic exercise have all been shown to, to increase it. So those are things that you, you can look at. So also the kinurinin to tryptophan ratio, and even though tryptophan may be lower in mood disorders, depression, current research suggests that the IDO enzyme activity and production of the neurotoxin kinurinin pathway metabolites like kinurinin and quinolinic acid are not always upregulated in patients with mood disorders. 
major depressive disorder may be accompanied by tryptophan depletion without IDO activity or kinurinin metabolite activation or an increase in the KT ratio. So depression on its own isn't always associated with increased KT ratio, but the increased KT ratio may increase the risk of depression. And this is a, a, a slide and it does a good job. Um, this study from 219, they looked at untreated, treated, they look at um, urine, plasma, spinal fluid. So it just kind of, it just depends on when you're looking to what research you're looking at and what specimen you're looking at and what person you're looking at, you wanna make sure they're on the same. So some of them, you know, it varies by a lot. Phenylalanine seems to be low in everyone with depression. Alanine tends to be high, but something like lactic acid or lactate may depend on what specimen or if they're treated or untreated. This is a diagram. It looks kind of junior because you can, I made it. Um, so it's looking at all these studies and breaking them down by age, um, gender, and looking to see what of those in the Krebs cycle is impacted by mood disorder. So generally you'll see most of these increasing. And then glutathione is also impacted um, with depression. Um, as is IL-6. So um, IL-6 could be an early marker for cognitive decline in depression. It corresponds to severity and increased HPA axis. So it's something that you might want to look at. So this is, I find really interesting. They looked at this in this study, they looked at a multi-omics approach with the microbiota gut-brain axis in depression and demonstrated that it was really gut um, bacteria that decided what plasma protein. So you eat dietary protein and depending on what gut bacteria are there, it can impact the level of plasma protein. High plasma protein is associated with more um, diet depression severity. So if people had high levels of intake and high um, plasma protein, they were more likely to be more depressed. So plasma protein, proline, was positively associated with Enterobacter, Prevotella, and negatively associated with Bifido and Roseburia. So it really went back to having good gut bacteria. There were some subjects who ate higher levels of proline um, but had low plasma proline, and they found that they had good microbial composition of gut bacteria. So plasma proline levels are dependent on the gut microbiome composition and functionality. So the authors of the study had proposed that diets with reduced proline content may have a strong impact on ameliorating depressive severity and that targeting microbiome with increased fibers and reduced dietary proline may open new windows. So you can see that this person has high proline and hydroxyproline. It could be from collagen catabolism, but it may also be from diets and related to their level of gut bacteria. They don't look terrible, but roseberry is pretty low. So gut microbiota and major depressive disorder on its own without looking at, um, you know, its relationship with proline. They've certainly found that um, that matters and that F. prodsnitsi and roseburia, if they're low, can be related with more depression. So that was a small study, but F. prodsnitsi has been consistently associated with higher quality of life indicators um, in the Flemish Gut Project. And then this is the table to look at with major depressive disorder. So considerations, so help ensure adequate protein levels, um, balance animal protein, with carbohydrates, so tryptophan, you can give it its leg up, increase fibers and polyphenols. Exercise, again, can move out the canurinin um, accumulation, adequate sleep. And then I think here more than anything, like moderate circadian rhythms. You know, gut, you know, gut bacteria can play a big part. Gut bacteria, they don't like to do a lot of work at night either. So, and then people do better 
I think, with the whole chrononutrition. And then supplements, you know, when I have targeted supplements, anti-inflammatory. You can think of 5-HTP. If they have a high KT ratio, you likely don't want to add tryptophan that would just feed that KT ratio. So a lot of clinicians may use 5-HTP. And then targeting gut with polyphenols and fibers. So I've also put this together, This and it's just looking at the, the things that were covered, aging, diabetes, and mood, and, and what are things you see that are consistent and what um, are not consistent. And hopefully we'll just add to these as they, um, if we come out with more um, research modules. So metabolomics is the comprehensive analysis of all metabolites in the system. And testing can help personalize treatments. So the omics profile is a great way to see at the molecular level what's happening with aging or diabetes um, or mood disorders. The GI map can help look at what's going on in the gut and then all these other markers, the genomic insights and inflammation with the cytodetox, they can just throw a wider net. So finishing up with the defining metabolomic signatures. Thank you very much. Uh, a question here, is the OMX a combination of organic acids and the GI map? No, the OMX itself, I mean, I always look at them together. The OMX profile looks at organic acids and it also looks at amino acids. So you can do the amino acids by themselves um, or the um, organic acids by themselves. And the amino acids can be done in um, urine or blood, but the, the main omics profile looks at um, organic acids and amino acids. So you can see that whole, all the pathways. Is there any references to cancer and uh, metabolics? Um, there are, there's lots. Um, I haven't really jumped into that because it's big. Um, <laughs> so there may be some certain things that are um, specific to cancer, but like those NIH studies, they were trying to see which cancers, even like kidney cancer, um, different kinds and the impact they have. So I think there's a lot um, and we'll likely get to that and get uh, a webinar made on that, uh, done on that. It's just a, something really big to wrap your, mm -hmm. wrap your head around, but there is a lot of information on it. Next question. What does high ketones mean on the OMX test? We're looking at um, a specific ketone, which is the, the most common one. So it can mean um, different things. So somebody might not be processing um, things right. So they have increase in ketones. They may be specifically on a diet that they want to increase their ketones. They may not have eaten in a long time. You know, I wonder if some of those, um, when you look at the mood disorder, somebody's really depressed, maybe their ketones are elevated because they're just not eating anything. So it, it can be a lot of, of variations of things, but generally it's that you've switched from burning um, glucose and have gone to um, with fatty acid oxidation to burn that to run the Krebs cycle. Thank you. Our next question, metabolic pattern and metabolic profile, are they different? If so, how? Yeah, they're the same. So they call it different things. So metabolic signature, metabolic pattern, metabolic profile. It's just who's writing the paper, essentially. There's also metabolic fingerprint. So it's really just a different ways of saying what patterns of metabolites are you going to see in whatever you're looking at, whether it's a disease or a diet. Um, so they're the same. Thank you. How often to run these tests to determine if DAS interve interventions are working? Um, I think that, you know, we generally think about, you know, running the test and then follow up. You know, our general is three to six months, but it's going to depend on how quickly you think you can see changes, how much, how many changes you're making, how severe are those changes. And, you know, so the more significant changes you make, the more likely you're going to see changes in the metabolites over time. So you might want to do it 
um, in three months. Some people might want to do it in you know, a month or six weeks. Some, some people might wait six months. So it, it really just depends which ones you're looking at and what changes you want to see. And just for overall health, and in some of the metabolomics researchers have noted that they think it's a good thing to get for just overall health check just once a year, like, you know, get it and kind of see what you look like metabolically when all things are going good. But as far as follow up, it just depends on how much you're making changes. Thank you. Our next question, what are some resources to learn more about metabolomics and early indicators of disease transition? Um, well, like I have mentioned, the DSL Academy should be um, coming open pretty soon. And we have some full length webinars um, on each of these, and then we'll be adding those. And we have more detail on just looking at the omics and the, and the GI map um, in general. I think the, the number one place I generally go is the human metabolome database and um, to look to read about it. Um, they don't necessarily give disease like well, patterns, but they do talk a lot about individual markers. So if I was looking for, say, you know, lactic acid and a, and uh, online, I would just put in Google lactic acid and HMDB and it would go right there and, and, and let me see. Otherwise, I just go to PubMed and put the disease I'm looking for with the word metabolomics and, and several should come up. We have time for about one more question. Um, how do clinicians know what is enough protein intake? I would look at what are, you know, what are the requirements and then testing, ideally, I would test like organic acids, urine amino acids, and plasma amino acids. So urine's gonna let me see what they're excreting, plasma's gonna let me see what are, you know, that two week or so baseline levels. Um, and are, is that person getting enough protein to maintain that level? Probably before I did that test, I mean, I might do it as a start, but if you can't, you know, it's hard to do lots of testing, but I would probably get them started on focusing on, you know, getting adequate protein and having that distributed throughout the day, especially in older adults and aging, it's better to distribute it out, to day, out throughout the day um, to build that and then do that for like a month or so and then test because you've already, you're testing to see is what I'm doing kind of working. Keep doing it and then maybe test again. So there's not a perfect way to see for that person. You really have to test to see how are they metabolically processing all that. So things like, you know, certain guidelines are just guidelines and you won't really know for any individual unless you test. Thank you. And we'll do one last question here. How sensitive to lifestyle, like diet, activity, et cetera, is the OMX? Are there pre-test recommendations to capture the best snapshot? Yeah, so it's um, it's going to be pretty sensitive. You know, urine amino acids are going to be changed readily, and some organic acids can be changed more readily with diet. Um, some may just be your metabolic um, step that you're looking at. Um, are there pre-test recommendations? Oh, pre-test recommendations, right. Yeah. So that, you know, we have to avoid some pectins. So that's listed in the, the instructions because that can specifically interfere with some things like citric acid. It can kind of pump those up. It doesn't in interfere with the testing so much as it just bumps those up. There is a big debate on baseline. Like, do you want to test and see what are you doing? And however, like how you're living your life, what's your status then? Because if you change what you're doing, you're looking at different markers because that's not what you normally do. Um, so it's really probably best to just keep doing what you normally do and then test that way. So not to make big changes. Um, so there's not specific things that are going to specifically interfere with running the test. But sometimes there are certain things that may, you know, you'll be able to see, like if something was elevated or super low, you could say, oh, did you do this? And that, that could account for it. 
Um, but I'm I'm pro baseline doing what you normally do, so you can get a really clear picture of what that is. Great. Thank you very much. And I want to thank uh, Dr. Redmond again for a great presentation, a lot of great feedback in the chat box throughout the webinar. So thank you for your time today. Um, and I also want to thank all of our attendees for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. Thank you all and have a great rest of your day.